Income tax 2023-2024 lifetime learning credit. What expenses qualify? Get ready and some coffee because we're setting our refund to the max with income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in Publication 970, Tax Benefits for Education, Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're at the bottom part of the income tax formula where the credits live. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement ending not with net income, but rather taxable income taxable income therefore basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula however that's only half the story half the battle we're then going to take that taxable income calculate the tax on it using not a flat tax but a progressive tax system to get to tax before credits and other taxes other taxes including things like self-employment tax if you happen to have a sole proprietorship schedule c situation the credits our point of focus here similar to deductions in that both deductions and credits are good but a dollar deduction would simply decrease the income statement part of the income tax formula reducing taxable income only getting the part of the dollar deduction which would be based on your tax rate whereas if you got a full dollar of a credit and you had it in the non-refundable area up top here you would still get the full dollar of benefit if you had enough tax liability to cover that tax dollar of benefit meaning if it's in the non-refundable category it can't take the tax liability below zero because it wouldn't be a tax but benefit program in that instance that would get to the total tax then we subtract out the payments and refundable credits payments including withholdings estimated tax payments refundable credits can take the tax liability below zero and therefore are acting not as a tax but as a welfare benefit safety net program finally get into the bottom line tax refund or tax due this is the form 1098 t if we're talking about education expenses we will typically get this from the financial institution leading us to know that we at least had some expenses that were paid but possibly we might not be calculating the credit based on exactly these amounts because it can get complicated in terms of what expenses qualify as well as scholarship situations and so on and so forth this is the form 8863 education credits american opportunity credit and lifetime learning credits which flow into the schedule three additional credits and payments for part one the non-refundable credits flowing to line three education credits from form 8863 which flows into page two of the form 1040 in the tax and credits the non-refundable section line 20 which is the amount from schedule three and when we're talking about the american opportunity credit we have that uh, refundable component which would flow directly into line 29 from form 8863 okay so what expenses qualify so remember we're looking lifetime learning credit this time not the american opportunity credit we would first be looking to try to get the american opportunity credit which is more stringent and qualifications typically more stringent and then we usually have less stringent qualifications in the lifetime learning to qualify for the credit however with the expenses themselves sometimes those actually might be a little bit more stringent on the lifetime learning side than the american opportunity side so let's take a look at those they're not exactly the same possibly here so the lifetime learning credit is based on qualified education expenses you pay for yourself your spouse or a dependent you claim on your tax return so similar there to the american opportunity so i'll go through this a little bit faster because we'll see a lot of similarities but there will be distinctions as well that we want to basically be pointing out so generally the credit is allowed for qualified education expenses paid in 2023 for an academic period beginning in 2023 or in the first three months of 2024 similar cutoff situation we saw with the American Opportunity Credit there. For example, if you paid $1,500 in December 2023 for qualified tuition for the spring 2024 semester beginning in January 2024, you may be able to use the $1,500 in figuring your 2023 credit. We talked about that same situation as with the American Opportunity Credit. 
academic period. An academic period includes semester, trimester, quarter, or other period of study, such as summer school session as reasonably determined by an educational institution. Once again, that's basically the same as we talked about with the American Opportunity Credit. If an educational institution uses credit hours or clock hours and doesn't have academic terms, each payment period can be treated as an academic period paid with borrowed funds. You can claim a lifetime learning credit for qualified education expenses paid with proceeds of a loan. Similar situation that we talked about, same situation in essence with regards to the American Opportunity Credit. You use the expenses to figure the lifetime learning credit for the year in which the expenses are paid, not the year in which the loan is repaid. So if you want me to dive into more details on these areas that are the same, you can go into the American Opportunity Credit. For now, I'm just gonna kind of run through these because we've talked about them in a bit more detail with the American Opportunity Credit. Treat loan uh, disbursements sent directly to the educational institution as paid on the date the institution credits the student's account. Student withdraws from classes. You can claim a lifetime learning credit for qualified education expenses not refunded when a student withdraws. So if you drop the class, but you don't get the money back, you may still, still be able to add it in as calculating the credit. Qualified education expenses. All right, so for purposes of the lifetime learning credit, qualified education expenses are tuition and certain related expenses required for enrollment in course at an educational uh, eligible educational institution. So obviously the enrollment fees are something that you would expect would qualify. It's the other stuff that comes up into questions such as books and supplies, for example. The course must meet either part of the post-secondary degree program or taken by the student to acquire or improve job skills. So once again, the course must be either part of a post-secondary degree program or taken by the student to acquire or improve job skills. Eligible educational institution. An eligible educational institution is any college, university, vocational school, or other post-secondary educational institution eligible to participate in the student aid program administered by the U.S. Department of Education. So remember that the government usually is going to have their hands in some education in some way, shape, or form. Either they get the institution, the school gets money directly from the government, or the government is going to be financing students in the form of loans who are then paying the loans to get the education, in which case they're still basically kind of indirectly involved in financing and basically subsidizing. And even if you don't have a situation where those loans are in place, then you still have these educational credits and whatnot, which are going to structure the way courses might be designed if they want their students to be able to get the tax benefits related to here. But generally, those student loans are going to have a huge impact and, and are going to allow the, the government to kind of structure things. That's how they're able to have influence over basically educational institutions to a large degree. So virtually all accredited public nonprofit and proprietary privately owned profit making post-secondary institutions meet this definition. So the institution you're at should be able to tell you whether or not they meet that. And typically they're gonna be aiming to meet that because they know that most students are only able to afford education with the help of student loan programs that are funded uh, through government programs, right? So an eligible educational institution also includes certain educational institutions located outside the United States that are eligible to participate in a student aid program administered by the U.S. Department of Education. So related expenses, student activity fees and expenses for courses related books, supplies, equipment are included in qualified education expenses only if the fees and expenses must be paid to the institution for enrollment or attendance. So that's a bit different than we saw for the American Opportunity Credit where, for example, if you go to a college, they might have an enrollment fee and then force you to buy your own books and whatnot, in which case you might not buy it from the institution, in which case it might be still added as an expense for the American Opportunity Credit if you were taking that, but possibly not for the lifetime learning credit, given the fact 
that the, they had to be paid only if the fees and expenses must be paid to the institution for enrollment or attendance. So different institutions will have different formats in terms of how they're going to structure the requirements. Traditional universities often just basically say, we're going to collect fees to enroll you in the course, and then you're on your own to buy the books and all the supplies, which we require you to buy. But vocational schools and whatnot often include all of those supplies and things within the cost of the enrollment fee, in which case you're kind of paying that stuff directly to the institution. So that might be a factor to take into consideration when you're choosing the institution uh, and whatnot. But again, it's just one of those things that kind of changes how schools are going to structure things to try to deal with these these laws, and which I don't think is good, particularly because we're it's not the thing you want decisions to be based on, right? You want the people to make decisions on the best way to educate people, not on the best way to you know, get a credit that's been put together like 10 years ago that now they're still trying to comply with and whatnot. But in any case, qualified education expenses in 2023 for an academic period that begin in the first three months of 2024 can be used in figuring an education credit for 2023 only. See academic period earlier, similar situation. For example, if you pay $2,000 in December 2023 for qualified tuition for the 2024 winter quarter that begins in January 2024, you can use the $2,000 in figuring an education credit for 2023 only. I believe that's the same situation as with the American Opportunity Credit where we have that cutoff situation. Example, Jackson, a sophomore uh, in University V's degree program in dentistry. Uh, this year, in addition to tuition, is are they trying to rhyme here? And this year, in addition to tuition, Jackson is required to pay a fee to the university for the rental of the dental equipment uh, that will be used in this program. I feel like I'm doing a rap song here or something. Because the equipment rental fee must be paid to uh, University V for enrollment and attendance, the equipment rental fee is a qualified expense. That's often the case for something like a vocational school, such as dentistry, where you're going to pay for the equipment usage to the school, as opposed to if you took an undergraduate degree, for example, or even a graduate degree at a university, in which case you buy your own books, which might not be paid directly to the institution. Example number two, Donna and Charles, both first student uh, students at College W, are required to have certain books and other reading materials to use in their mandatory first year classes. The college has no policy about how students should obtain these materials, but any student who purchases them from College W's bookstore will receive a bill directly from the college. So Charles bought the books from the friend so what was paid for, for them isn't a qualified education expense. Donna bought the books at College W's bookstore. So although Donna paid College W directly for the first year books and materials, the payment isn't a qualified expense because the books and materials aren't required to be purchased from College W for enrollment or attendance at the institution. So this is a common situation with more classical college situations where they enroll you in the course. They say you're on your own to buy the books and other materials, which we're basically saying you have to buy generally. You could then go to the bookstore, but you're not required to. And typically, if you're not required to, you don't want to maybe because it's probably going to be more expensive at the bookstore than some other place, although it's easier to find at the bookstore typically. So those expenses, although they might have been includable if we were talking about the American Opportunity Credit, might not be includable here when we're talking about the lifetime uh, learning credit. But that's okay because we're probably talking about those GE courses. We're trying to take something like computer science or accounting or so, I, I don't business. And then they made us take those GE courses and we'll just take them pass, no pass and probably don't even need the book to get through the whatever the whatever stupid course they're making us sit through you know they could what are they going to do fail me i mean with the past i don't know i had a roommate that took a bunch of courses past no pass i couldn't do that because i came up through the through the uh the uh college the, the pre-college system uh the what i'm trying to say here community college so i already took all my ge's and i had to get a grade for for them 
And this other guy takes all the courses like pass, no pass, doesn't even buy the books for crying out loud. It doesn't affect his. Anyways, I don't want to get into that now. It's going to it's going to frustrate me. So example number three. When Marcy enrolled at College X for the freshman year, a uh, separate student activity fee in addition to tuition had to be paid. This activity fee is required of all students and is used solely to fund on-campus organizations and activities run by students such as the student newspaper and student government. No portion of the fee covers personal expenses, although labeled as a student activity fee. The fee is required for Marcy's enrollment and attendance at College X. Therefore, it is required expense. So that one's going to be included because we paid that to College X and it's required by them. So no double benefit allowed. Here we go. No double dip. And that's what I call it. We need some alliteration there so we can remember it. So you can't do any of the following. Deduct higher education expenses on your income tax return as, for example, business expense and also claim a lifetime learning credit. Similar situation for the American Opportunity Credit. You can't get the benefit in like a Schedule C and as a credit calculation. Claim a lifetime learning credit for any student and use any of that student's expenses in figuring your American Opportunity Credit. Again, double dipping. You can't get both credits for the same expenses. You got to take one or the other, you know, pick one. Usually you pick the American Opportunity if you qualify for that one first. Claim a lifetime learning credit based on the same expenses to figure the tax-free portion of a distribution from a Coverdell Education Savings Account, an ESA, or Qualified Tuition Program, QTP. See Coordination with American Opportunity and Lifetime Learning Credits in Chapter 6 and Coordination with American Opportunity and Lifetime Learning Credits in Chapter 7. So these are going to be types of tools that help us to basically save for education, which already give us tax benefits similar to kind of like a deduction. And if we also got a credit for them, we would once again kind of be double dipping. Claim a credit based on a qualified education expenses paid with tax-free educational assistance, such as a scholarship, a grant, or assistance provided by an employer. So once again, if we got free money, we kind of already got a deduction for it, a tax benefit by not having to include it in income, and therefore we can't also get a credit for it because we'd be double dipping. Adjustments to qualified education expenses. For each student, reduce the qualified education expenses paid by or on behalf of the student under the following rules. The result is the amount of adjusted qualified education expenses for each student. All right, so we got the tax-free educational assistance. Very similar here to what we saw with the calculations for the American Opportunity Credit. So for tax-free educational assistance received in 2023, reduce the qualified educational expenses for each academic period by the amount of tax-free educational assistance allocable to the academic period. So see academic period earlier. So we get tax-free tax educational assistance. We can't include that then as part of the expenses that we paid for the, the college. So we'd have to reduce the, the amount that we paid by the tax-free assistance that we had received. So some tax-free educational assistance received after 2023 may be treated as a refund or qualified education expenses paid in 2023. This tax-free educational assistance is any tax-free educational assistance received by you or anyone else after 2023 for qualified educational expenses paid on behalf of a student in 2023 or attributable to enrollment at an eligible educational institution during 2023 so hope that so if this tax-free educational assistance is received after 2023 but before you file your 2023 income tax return see refunds received after 2023 but before your income tax return is filed later so we have the similar situation where what if we got a refund kind of situation do i have to go back and amend my prior year tax return because i calculated a credit we talked about this situation with the American Opportunity Credit. Quite similar kind of scenario would happen here in a refund scenario. So tax-free educational assistance includes tax-free part of scholarship and fellowship grants. So now we've got the free money there, which is kind of like a deduction. We already got a tax-free benefit on it. So therefore, we have to reduce the amount of expenses when we're calculating 
the credit because we already got a benefit for that money. The tax-free part of Pell Grants, see Pell Grants and other Title IV need-based education grants. Employer-provided education assistance, so that would be on our W-2. We would see that in, in, uh, in I think, Box 10 it is on the W-2. So we already would have gotten a benefit for it possibly because it wouldn't be included in income in Box 1. Veterans educational assistance, any other non-taxable tax-free payments other than gifts or inheritance. So we saw this concept in, in the same way with the American Opportunity Credit. Generally, any scholarship or fellowship grant is treated as tax-free. However, a scholarship or fellowship grant isn't treated as tax-free to the extent the student includes it in gross income. So if it's not included in gross income, you already got a benefit that's kind of like you got a deduction for it. But if it's included in income, you would think you didn't get a tax benefit for it yet and therefore might be able to include it in the calculation of education expenses to calculate the credit. So the student may or may not be required to file a tax return for the year the scholarship or fellowship grant is received. And either of the following is true. The scholarship or fellowship grant or any part of it must be applied by its terms to expenses such as room or board other than qualified education expenses as defined in qualified education expenses chapter one. So here we have the same kind of scenario we looked at with the American Opportunity Credit where when we look at qualified expenses, room and board is not included. But when we look at the money that we got from some of these grants, room and more board could be included, which gives us some interesting play or leeway with regards to whether or not it could be included in income, which sometimes we might actually want it included in income because the fact that we don't have to include it in income is kind of equivalent to getting a deduction, which is good, but Credits are usually better than deductions. So if I included it in income, which means I negate the deduction that I would have got, but rather I get a credit, might that end up with a more beneficial tax situation? You can imagine a situation where that could possibly be the case. So the scholarship or fellowship grant or any part of it may be applied by its terms to expenses such as room and board other than qualified education expenses as defined in qualified education expenses in chapter one. All right, refunds. A refund of qualified education expenses may reduce adjusted qualified education expenses for the tax year or require payment recapture of a credit claimed in an earlier year. So we talked about this whole refund situation. It's similar to what we saw with the American Opportunity Credit. So I'm going to go through it a little bit more quickly here because the concept is the same. If you want to look at it in more detail, take a look at the American Opportunity Credit where we talked about it. Some tax-free educational assistance received after 2023 may be treated as a refund. See tax-free educational assistance earlier. Refunds received in 2023. For each student, figure the adjusted qualified education expenses for 2023 by adding all the qualified education expenses for 2023 and subtracting any refunds of those expenses received from the eligible educational institution during 2023. So you paid for the expenses. They gave you a refund. You got the refund in 2023 then you, you can account for it in 2023 because you know about it and take care of it. All right, so let's go through the questionnaire here. Can you claim the lifetime learning credit in 2023? So here's the quick, the quick questionnaire flowchart. Doesn't look too quick, it's kind of long, but it's quicker, it's fairly quick. So <laughs> did you pay qualified education expenses in 2023 for an eligible student? If yes, we can continue. If no, you can't claim the lifetime learning credit. Uh, did you did the academic period for which you paid qualified education expenses begin in 2023 or the first three months of 2024? So there's a cutoff situation. If yes, we continue. Is the eligible student you, your spouse, if married, filing joint, or your dependent, you claim on your tax return? If yes, we continue. If no, stop. So are you listed as a dependent on another person's return? Because if you're a dependent of someone else, then they're the one that might be able to claim the credit. So we're gonna say, uh, if no, we continue. 
Is your filing status married filing separate? If you're married, you got to be married filing joint or else the IRS will say, no, we don't trust you with that filing separate thing. And so we're going to say no. For any part of 2023, were you or your spouse a non-resident alien who didn't elect to be treated as a resident alien for tax purposes? If no, continue. Is your modified adjusted gross income, otherwise known as the MAGI, less than $90,000, $180,000 if married, filing joint? That's our income limitation. If yes, because we're under those thresholds, then we continue. Do you have a tax liability form 1040, 1040SR, line 18 minus schedule three, meaning do you have enough tax liability to consume the credit? If not, you're not going to get it because there's not a refundable part of the lifetime learning credit like there is for the American Opportunity Credit. So if yes, we continue. Are you claiming an American Opportunity Credit for the same student? You can't do that double dipping thing, claiming them both. So we say no and continue. Did you use the same expenses to claim a deduction like on the Schedule C as like a business deduction? You can't do that. You'd be double dipping again. So we're going to say no and continue. Were the same expenses paid with tax-free scholarship grant or employer-provided education assistance? If it was tax-free money that you used to pay for the for the education, you already got a benefit, which is kind of like a deduction. You can't also get a credit because that would be double dipping. So we're going to say no. Did you or someone else receive a refund of all the expenses? So if you got the money back because you dropped out before the refund thing, I'm not I'm not pointing fingers or anything. I'm not you know I'm just saying you just can't get the credit then. If no, you can claim the lifetime learning credit. So there we have it. Nice easy questionnaire right there. No problem. So refunds received after 2023 but before your income tax return is filed. Back to the refund situation. So if anyone receives a refund after 2023 of qualified education expenses paid on behalf of a student in 2023 and the refund is paid before you file an income tax return, the amount of qualified education expenses for 2023 is reduced by the amount of the refund. So that makes sense because you paid in 2023, you got refunded in 2024, but you haven't yet filed the 2023 tax return because you got paid before April 15th or even the extension if you're going on extension. So therefore you already have the information that you need in order to reduce the expenses for 2023 because you haven't yet filed it. So fix it before you file. So refund received after 2023 and after your income tax return is filed. So here's where the problem happens. So if anyone receives a refund after 2023 of qualified education expenses paid on behalf of a student in 2023 and the refund is paid after you file an income tax return for 2023, you may need to repay some or all of the credit. So now I already got the benefit. I calculated the credit in 2023. They gave me a refund in 2024, but I already filed the tax return in 2023. Do I have to amend 2023? Hopefully not. Hopefully we can figure out what the difference is and basically just fix it in 2024. If not, uh, be able to basically just reduce the amount of expenses in 2024 if we happen to be claiming the credit again, which, which is another scenario we might be able to use in that case. Credit recapture then. So if any tax-free educational expense uh, assistance for a qualified education expense is paid in 2023 or any refund of your qualified education expenses paid in 2023 is received after you file your 2023 income tax return, you must recapture, repay any excess credit. So you do this by figuring the amount of your adjusted qualified education expenses for 2023 by reducing the expenses by the amount of the refund or tax-free educational assistance. Uh, you then figure your education credits for 2023 and figure the amount by which your 2023 tax liability would have increased if you had claimed the, the refigured credits. Include that amount as additional tax for the year the refund or tax-free assistance was received. So in other words, you kind of act as though you're going to fix 2023 and amend it, recalculate in 2023 after having reduced the expenses by the amount of the refund. But instead of filing a 1040X amended return, you just take that difference and add it 
as an added tax in your pr next year filing so that that's a little bit easier. Example, uh, you paid $9,300 in tuition and fees in December 2023 uh, and your child began college in January 2024. You filed your 2023 tax return on February 14th, 2024 and claimed a lifetime learning credit of $1,160. You claimed no other tax credits. After you filed your return, your child withdrew from two courses and you received a refund of $2,900. I knew it. I knew it. I told, I was like, this, this, there's no way this kid's going to stick with it. And they, then, but at least they dropped out before the cutoff date. So we got our money back. Any case, whatever, dude, you must, you must refigure your 2023 lifetime learning credit using the $6,400 of qualified education expenses instead of 9,300. The refigured credit is 1280 and your tax liability increased by $580. See the instructions for uh, your 2024 income tax return. So we paid 9300 but they dropped out and we got the money before we filed. So, we got the, so, so that means that we can account for it before filing uh, the tax return reducing the amount that we paid by the amount that we got refunded tip oh wait hold on that's not the case we got refunded after we filed the tax return so you claim no other after you filed the return your child withdrew uh from the two courses so now do i have to go back and amend the prior year tax return no but we kind of have to go back and do the calculation as though we were amending it so you must refigure your 2023 lifetime learning credit using 6400 because that's the 9300 minus the amount that we got refunded of the qualified education expenses instead of 9300 so the refigured credit is 1280 and your tax liability increased. So we look at the difference in the tax liability, it increased by 580. Instead of getting that 580 by filing a 1040X amended return, we're gonna see instructions for your 2024 income tax return, possibly including it as a, an added tax just in 2024, which should be a little easier. All right, tip. If you pay qualified education expenses in both 2023 and 2024 for an academic period that begins in the first three months of 2024 and you receive tax-free educational assistance or a refund as described above, you may choose to reduce your qualified education expenses for 2024 instead of reducing your expenses for 2023. So in other words, if we claim the lifetime learning credit again in 2024, then possibly instead of refiguring the tax for 2023, we can just reduce the amount of expenses that we paid in 2024 in figuring the lifetime learning credit for that year. All right, so amounts that don't reduce qualified education expenses. Don't reduce qualified education expenses by amounts paid with funds that students rec receives as payments for services such as wages. So if we had to include it in wages, then we included that in income and therefore any of those that we used to then purchase education, you would think would be qualified as part of the education expenses alone. So again, we don't reduce the amount that we paid for education by the amount that we borrowed because borrowing is not the same as us getting free money, right? We have to pay and rent that money with the form of interest, a gift. So if someone gifts you the money, you have gift tax and inheritance tax to deal with, but that's still a gift to you that you can use however you want. And if you pay for the education with it, it's not like it's tax free money in the same instance as if you got that money from like taxes or grants or something like that. And inheritance is a similar situation as with the gifting situation. And uh, a withdrawal from the student's personal savings. So obviously, if it's your own savings, you don't have to reduce the amount of expenses from your savings that you use to buy education. Don't reduce the qualified education expenses by any scholarship or fellowship grant reported as income on the student's tax return in the following situation. 
So the use of the money is restricted by the terms of the scholarship or fellowship grant to costs of attendance, such as room and board, other than qualified education expenses as defined in qualified education expenses in Chapter 1. The use of the money isn't restricted. So we talked about that. I think that's the same situation as with the American Opportunity Credit. Coordination with Pell Grants and other scholarships. You may be able to increase your lifetime learning credit with the student you, your spouse, or your dependent uh, includes certain scholarships or fellowship grants and the student's gross income. So your credit may increase only if the amount of the student's qualified education expenses minus the total amount of scholarship and fellowship grants is less than $10,000. Now, this is a similar situation as we saw with the American Opportunity Credit, so I'm going to go through it a little bit more quickly. But remember, the general premise here is that if you've got money from a scholarship or a grant or something like that, you basically got kind of a deduction because you got money you didn't have to include in income, which is the same as though if you did have to include it in income and then got an above-the-line deduction reducing taxable income, only giving you a benefit to the extent or based on your tax rate as opposed to a credit, which when you get to the bottom line credit calculation, a dollar credit gives you a full dollar of benefit. So in some cases you might say, well, look, I don't want to have to get the deduction. I would rather record it in income, paying taxes on it, but then get the credit, the credit being worth more than the deduction. So in some cases that might be the case, it would only be the case, uh, you would think, if it's less than $10,000 that you paid because $10,000 is the amount that maximizes the lifetime learning credit as opposed to what we saw with the American Opportunity Credit, which maxes out after $4,000 because the calculation is a little bit different. So you have $10,000 to max out at, at the 2000 amount of the credit, which we'll talk more about later. So. Uh, in certain situations, if you paid less than 10000 and you're dealing with scholarship grants and whatnot, then you might look into the scenario where uh, if you can include the money in income from the scholarship grants due to having some of it allocated to room and board as opposed to qualified expenses for things that you paid for the institution, then in some cases it, it might have a tax benefit. Okay. So if this situation applies, consider including some or all the scholarship or fellowship grant in the student's income in order to treat uh, the included amount as paying non-qualified expenses instead of qualified education expenses. Non-qualified expenses are expenses such as room and board that aren't qualified education expenses such as tuition and related fees. Scholarship and fellowship grants that the student includes in income don't include the student's qualified education expenses available to figure your lifetime learning credit, thus uh, including enough of the scholarship or fellowship grant in the student's income to report up to $10,000 in qualified education expenses for your lifetime learning credit may increase the credit by enough to increase your tax refund or reduce the amount of tax you owe, even considering any increased tax liability from the additional income, basically because credits are going to be more valuable than deductions from the tax calculation. However, the increase in tax liability as well as the loss of other tax credits may be greater than the additional lifetime learning credit and may cause your tax refund to decrease or the amount of tax you owe to increase. So the interplay of increasing your income could have positive or negative impacts on things like your earn, earned income tax credit or, or other types of credits and whatnot. So it gets a little bit confusing, especially when you get into these refundable credits or the lower income side of things and the interplay between non-refundable and refundable credits and so on and so forth. So your specific circumstances will determine what amount, if any, of the scholarship or fellowship grant uh, to which in income is maximize your tax refund or minimize the amount of tax you owe. All right. The scholarship or fellowship grant must be one that may qualify as a tax-free scholarship under the rules discussed in chapter one. Also, the scholarship or fellowship grant must be one that may, by its terms, be used for non-qualified expenses. Finally, 
The amount of scholarship or fellowship grant that is applied to non-qualified expenses can't exceed the amount of the student's actual non-qualified expenses that are paid in the tax year. This amount may differ from the student's living expenses estimated by the student's school and figure in the official costs of attendance under student aid rules. The fact that the educational institution applies the scholarship or fellowship grant to qualified education expenses such as tuition and related fees doesn't prevent the student from choosing to apply certain scholarship or fellowship grants to the student's actual non-qualified expenses. So in other words, you might have paid the scholarship directly to the institution even though some of the money was for room and board. The fact that you that the scholars that the school is applying it to tuition doesn't necessarily mean that you can't still apply it to basically the amount that you're paying for in essence room and board similar situation we saw with the american opportunity credit so by making this choice uh, that is by including the part of the scholarship or fellowship grant applied to the student's non-qualified expenses in income the student may increase taxable income and may be required to file a tax return but this allows uh, payments made in cash by check by credit or debit card or with borrowed funds such as student loan to be applied to qualified education expenses all right example number two scholarship excluded from income so the facts are the same as an example one where we had no scholarship except that judy was awarded a one thousand five hundred dollar scholarship under the terms of the scholarship, it may be used to pay any additional expenses, including room and board. So she's got that leeway with the room and board here. So if the scholarship is excluded from income, Judy will be deemed for purposes of figuring the education credit to have applied the scholarship to pay for tuition, required fees and course material. Only 3000 of the 4,500 tuition paid in 2023 could be used when figuring the 2023 lifetime learning credit because we'd have to take the tuition, reduce it by the scholarship because we're assuming that that was paid for the, the educational institution situation and wasn't included in income. The lifetime learning credit would be reduced to $600 and the tax liability after credits would be 965. Example three, scholarship included in income. So now we're gonna include it in income in an attempt to get a credit which is more valuable than the deduction or the exclusion of the scholarship money and in income. So the facts are the same as an example two, scholarship excluded from income. If unlike example two, Judy includes $1,500 scholarship in income, Judy will be deemed to have applied the entire scholarship to pay for room and board. So now it's not included in expenses that qualify for the, the, the expenses for education expenses, right? So Judy's AGI and modified AGI would increase to 30,200 because she had to include the scholarship and in income now. The taxable income would be 16,350 and the tax liability, so that's after we have the standard deduction and the tax liability before credits would be, so tax calculated 1,745 before we do the credit thing. So Judy would be able to use $4,500 of adjusted qualified education expenses to figure the credit now. So Judy could claim a $900 lifetime learning credit and the tax liability after credits would be $845. Example number four, scholarship applied by the post-secondary school to tuition. So the facts are the same as example three, scholarship included in income except the $1,500 scholarship is paid directly to the public community college. So the fact that the public community college applies the scholarship to Judy's tuition and related fees doesn't prevent Judy from including the $1,500 scholarship in income. So this is just a logistics kind of situation. Can she still do what she did before even though the school basically got paid directly and is applying that money to the tuition and fees and so on? As in example three, by doing so, Judy will be deemed to have applied the entire scholarship to FAVE for room and board. 
Judy could claim the $900 lifetime learning credit and the tax liability after credits would be $845. Note, whether you will benefit from applying a scholarship or fellowship grant to non-qualified expenses will depend on... Uh, on the amount of students' qualified education expenses, the amount of the scholarship or fellowship grant, and whether the scholarship or fellowship grant may, by its terms, be used for non-qualified expenses. Any benefits will also depend on the student's federal and state marginal tax rates, as well as any federal and state tax credits and the student claims. Before deciding, look at the local, uh, the total amounts of your federal and state tax refunds or taxes owed. And if the student is your dependent, the student's tax refunds or taxes owed. So for example, if you are the student and you also claim the earned income credit, choosing to apply a scholarship or fellowship grant to non-qualified expenses by including the amount in your income may not benefit you if the decrease to your earned income credit as a result of including the scholarship or fellowship grant is income uh, is more than the increase in your lifetime learning credit. So in other words, there's a lot of other factors in especially the low income side of things when you start messing around with the income like the earned income credit, which interesting enough actually goes up as your income goes up up to a certain level typically and then and then goes back down again so in any case a lot of factors expenses that don't qualify qualified education expenses don't include amounts paid for insurance medical expenses and student including student health fees room and board are not for the educational expenses we saw them in the scholarship money but remember, they're not included in the calculation for education expenses for the lifetime learning credit. That's why you have that leeway of being able to include the amount in income and not and so on. Transportation or similar personal living or family expenses, sports, games, hobbies, and non-credit courses. So qualified education expenses generally don't include expenses that relate to any course of instruction or other education that involves sports, games, or hobbies, or any non-credit course. So the bowling, my bowling course. However, if the course of instruction or other education is part of the student's degree program or is taken by the student to acquire or improve job skills, these expenses can qualify comprehensive or bundle fees so some eligible educational institutions combine all of their fees for an academic period into one amount if you don't receive or don't have access to an allocation showing how much you paid for qualified education expenses and how much you paid for personal expenses such as those listed above contact the institution so again, this is how the institution is greatly impacted on how they're going to bundle things together, buy things like the credits and so on. And these credits were put together years ago, which, which again, I don't think that's actually a good, this is an example in my mind of how bureaucracy and these kind of tax laws actually can hinder the performance for, for institutions to provide the best services because they're stuck having to format things as they were formatted 20 years ago because the, these laws make it so they can't change the thing because they froze it in time to do, put the law in place. But anyway, okay, the institution is generally required to make this allocation and provide you with the amount you paid for qualified education expenses on Form 1098-T. See figuring credit later for more information about Form 1098-T.